Good morning again, and we'd like to welcome those who are joining us on Facebook at this time. If you have your Bibles this morning, I would invite you to turn with me into Mark's account of the gospel. We'll be reading in chapter 8 and beginning with verse 27. And at this point in Mark's account, uh, we reach a major turning point. Uh, everything that takes place from this point on, Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. And this will be the time in which he goes to present himself as the sacrifice for our sins. So in Mark 8, 27, as we read, let us remember it's the Holy Spirit who inspired this and invite him to inspire our hearts. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Let's pray as we seek God's guidance. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will take this and that you will use it in our hearts and in our lives, that you will give us understanding, Lord, that you'll give us application. We ask, Lord, that you will speak to us. I confess, Lord, that I am totally inadequate to teach your word. And so I ask for your anointing Anoint me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, speak to our hearts. Lord, I ask that you would cleanse me of all of my iniquity. That you make me a vessel that is fit for your use. And it's in the precious name of our Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. Life is filled with all kinds of questions. Most of them are probably not all that significant. A lot of the questions that we answer that seem so important at the time lose their importance just as about as quickly as they gained it. Service is over today, you'll probably be asking the question. What am I going to have for lunch? And that will seem very important. Now, you don't have to worry about that yet. It's still a little early. But it'll seem so important at the time. And after it's over, that question has lost all of its significance. And we experience a lot of questions like that. But there are other questions that are very important. Even life-changing or life-altering questions like, am I being true to my values? Boy, that's just not fair after an election to ask that, is it? That's an important question. It's a life-altering question. Questions like, will I marry? Boy, that one will change your life, won't it? Or how about this one? Am I going to have kids? I remember when we had our first child and people would say, you know, it is obvious when you're going to be starting a family, you know, and people would say, oh boy, your life is going to change. And I don't know that young couples want to hear that, 
But boy, is your life going to change. Now, it's not all bad, but your life is going to change dramatically when you answer that question. Or it may be, am I going to continue with my education? Oh, and here's a really good one. Are the people in my life a positive influence? It's a good question, don't you think? Who am I surrounding myself with? Or some of us probably need to answer this question. Am I going to get the help I need? It's life altering. Or how about do I spend enough time with the people I truly value? Or what is preventing me from doing what I really need to be doing? What am I going to do with the rest of my life? I mean, that list can just go on and on. And all of these are important, life-changing, life-altering questions. But it's here on the road to Caesarea Philippi that Jesus presents the single most important question that we will ever answer. It is so basic that it will influence every decision that you will ever make after that. It is so important that it will determine the very course and the nature of your life and beyond that it will determine your eternal destiny. And so wisdom would say, we really need to pause long enough to explore that question. Who do you say I am? As we look into this story, the very first thing that Mark points out is the location. Now, this isn't really a side note. This is really an important part of understanding what's going on in these events. And so the location is highly significant. It's like the first three rules of real estate. It's location, location, location. And this location is extremely important. Jesus and his disciples are on the road to Caesarea Philippi. And you may even be wondering, what in the world is so significant about that? Well, Caesarea Philippi is the place where gods are born and made. I've had the tremendous privilege of going to Caesarea Philippi. And it is a beautiful place. It's in northern Israel. It sits at the foot of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is roughly 10,000 feet in elevation. And it is a place that has a tremendous ancient history that is even associated with it until this day. Because in ancient history, the city gained its fame as the center of Baal worship. In fact, when you go there today and you're at a place that's called Bania Springs, there's a cliff that's in front of you. And there's little niches that are carved out in that cliff that were for the idol Baal. And so it gained its fame. In fact, it was even known as Bellinius in honor of the Phoenician god. And then the Greeks came along. And it's here that they found their god of gods. According to Greek mythology, 
Pan, the god of nature, was born in a grotto in that cliff or a cave. In fact, as you look at that cliff face, near the bottom of it there is a cave or a grotto, and from it springs one of the four headwaters of the Jordan River. And so the Greeks thought this place has to be the birth of Pan, the god of nature. And so they gave it a name to signify its importance, and they called it Panius in honor of their Greek god. And even to this day, it still holds its religious significance from its past. If you noticed, I told you the name of the spring was the Banius Springs, which is a union between Bellinus and Panius. And when Jesus was there with his disciples, sitting there a little further up on the hillside, was a gleaming white marble temple that Herod the Great had erected in honor of Caesar Augustus, the ruler of the world, who was thought to be God. You see, it's right here in the arena of Caesarea Philippi where the gods duel to the death that Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say? I am. If he is the Christ, then there are no substitutes. Baal, Pan, Caesar must go. If he is the Christ, you cannot hold on to your idols and your false gods. You can't hold on to them and follow Christ at the same time. And so if Jesus is the Christ... He's saying, they have to go. You see, the call of Jesus is exclusive. When Jesus calls us to follow him, it doesn't leave room for us to follow anything else. In fact, Jesus made that clear when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we might be asking, well, what's that have to do with me? I don't worship Baal. Never have. Never will. Never worship Pan or Caesar. And I'm too sophisticated to have idols in my life. But whatever has first place in your life is your God. And anything that we put before God is an idol. And Jesus says, it has to go. You can't put anything else before me. It's exactly what God stated when he gave the law. You shall have no other gods before me. I know people have debated what that means. And to me he's saying, don't even think about having them in my presence. You can't have other gods and have me. It's like the challenge that Joshua set before the people of Israel when he said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. And so it's here on the road to Caesarea Philippi that Jesus starts down the long road that will lead to Jerusalem that will ultimately bring him to the cross where he will give his life as a ransom for us, paying our sin debt. And so it's on the way that Jesus asked his disciples two questions. First he asked is, who do people say I am? And the disciples no doubt thought, got this. 
That one is easy. We know what people have been saying about Jesus. And so they remember Herod's response that Jesus must be John the Baptist raised from the dead whom he had killed. And others began thinking the same thing, that perhaps Jesus was John the Baptist. And it's kind of a strange response in all honesty. They were contemporaries. It wasn't like Jesus showed up after John was gone. There's only about six months difference in their age. They're cousins. And by the way, they're not that much alike. John's doing ministry out in the desert. Jesus was doing ministry around people. I mean, if you wanted to hear what John said, you had to go to him. Jesus came to the people. John didn't perform any miracles. Jesus did. John wore clothing made out of camel hair and he ate locusts and wild honey and Jesus partied with sinners. They're just not that much alike. But somehow people had made that association along with Herod. And then they recalled the speculation of those who had contended that Jesus was that fiery prophet Elijah or one of the other prophets. Now, all of that indicates that the people really held Jesus in high regard. These were tremendously respected people. These were great names in their history. And yet at the same time, their answer reveals that the people are still half blinded as to the reality as to who Jesus is. Reveal that these people are really afraid of the truth. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes some of the thing that scares us the most is the truth. And so the people are afraid to acknowledge who Jesus truly is. And so their answers reveal that they're still half blind because anyone, friend or enemy, cannot deny that Jesus' teachings are sound. That His miracles are good. Or that His power is great. But the blur of their nearsightedness is to simply acknowledge that Jesus is extraordinarily human, but not distinctly divine. They just don't have the slightest idea that Jesus truly is Emmanuel, that He is God with us, that He is God in the flesh. And so they identify him with the preaching of John, the social reforms of Elijah, the teaching of the prophets. But to them, Jesus is more than a common man, but he's less than God. If we were to ask that question of the world we live in today, what do people say about Jesus? Who do they say he is? The answers really haven't changed all that much, have they? They associate Jesus as a great teacher, just as the people of Israel thought about the prophets. And so there are those who will say that Jesus was a great teacher. Or like Elijah, they will associate Jesus as being a social reformer. Or like John the Baptist, a great prophet. I have to confess, that one really becomes confusing. Because the test of a prophet is they have to always be accurate. They have to always tell the truth. And if they don't, they're a false prophet. And Jesus claimed to be God. You cannot say that Jesus was a great prophet and deny that He was the Son of God, that He was God in the flesh who came and paid the price for our sins. And yet somehow in our 
blindness of the age, we think that we can say Jesus was a great prophet, but not distinctly divine. And so it's against that backdrop of public opinion that Jesus asks the critical question. What about you? Who do you say I am? Now it's personal. And now the disciples have heard that. It doesn't matter what the public holds as their opinion of Jesus. Now it's about you. Who do you say that Jesus is? And Peter, bless his heart, it just flows right out. You are the Christ. And I tell you, most of the time when something just came flowing out of Peter's mouth, it usually wasn't too good. But boy, that's not the case this time. He's nailed it. This is awesome. It's like finally all of the dots have connected. All of the teachings of Jesus, all of his preaching, all of his miracles have suddenly converged at this one moment in time. And Peter knows exactly who it is. And it has produced one of the greatest spiritual synergisms in the entire history of the world. Synergism is a breakthrough in human knowledge. It's when we have that aha experience, when the light bulb finally comes on. It's when that beam of light comes and reveals the answer to all the problems that we've been struggling with. It's when all of the pieces of the puzzle finally and suddenly fit together. And now we have the greatest breakthrough in the knowledge of human history when Peter says, you are the Christ. Of all people, the greatest confession in all history comes from the lips of Peter. Good job. But then Jesus tells us exactly how this happened. Great answer, Peter. But you didn't come up with that all by yourself. In Matthew's account, Jesus says, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Peter, you didn't come to this conclusion all by yourself. You didn't figure this out. You didn't reason it all out on your own. This was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. See, Jesus is teaching us that when the Spirit of God touches the human mind and the human heart with truth, we experience a synergism of revealed truth. And I imagine many of us have experienced that. You've had that aha experience when it suddenly came home. This is exactly who Jesus is. And so what does it mean when Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ? Well, in the Old Testament... There are three offices that required anointing. A prophet, priest, and a king. And when he says that you are the Christ, the anointed one, saying that you are God's anointed prophet. And so what does a prophet do? Well, a prophet speaks the word of God. And it's really unique here because not only does Jesus declare the word of God. I love this. Are you ready for this? He is the word of God. John stated it this way. In the beginning was the word. 
And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And then in the 14th verse he says, And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Jesus is the anointed prophet of God who not only speaks the Word of God, He is the Word of God. And He is God's anointed prophet priest. The priest is the one who would present the sacrifice for the people's sin. The priest is the one who would intercede before God on behalf of the people. The priest is the one who would bring the people before God. And Jesus is God's anointed priest. And not only is he God's anointed priest, He's the sacrifice as well. Jesus is the priest who presented himself as the sacrifice for the people's sin so that he could intercede on our behalf before God and bring us before him so that we can be in a relationship with God. And so he is God's anointed prophet. He's God's anointed priest. And he's God's anointed king. The king is the one who has the authority to rule over our lives, to govern over our life. The king is the one that we submit to. And so Jesus is God's anointed king, the one that we are to yield ourselves up to. That's why the scriptures teach us that when we come to Jesus, it's as our Savior and our Lord. We submit to him leading us in our life. But not only is he God's anointed king, he is the king of kings. Wow, what a confession. No wonder Jesus says, Peter, you didn't come up with this all on your own. And the reality is, is when we recognize who Jesus is, it's not because we came up with it on our own. We talked last week about God's pervenient grace and that's when God's working in our life to woo us to Him and He's revealing that reality to us and we're finally ready to acknowledge exactly who He is. And that's where we find Peter. And as we continue looking in Matthew's account, he gives us a little bit more information because Peter not only says you are the Christ, he confesses you are the Son of of the living God. See, not only are you God's anointed prophet, God's anointed priest, God's anointed king, he is now saying, you are divine. Jesus, you are God Almighty in the flesh. And so he is confessing that Jesus is God incarnate, that he is our anointed Lord and our anointed Savior. And that is the single greatest confession that has ever been made in the history of the world. But there is one more question. What about you? Who do you say Jesus Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for revealing to us exactly who Jesus is. We thank you that he came here as God in the flesh to pay our sin debt. And that he is the one who is worthy to govern over our life. To be our Lord and our Redeemer. And for that we are eternally grateful. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand.